we can follow the way this works by tracing the condition stimulus through the brain to the condition response. Uh, and in every animal that has been studied that has an amygdala, the amygdala is the centerpiece of uh, the system. The condition stimulus is uh, processed by the amygdala to produce the condition response. So this is the, uh, the appraisal system in the brain here it, uh, for, for this kind of um, emotional stimulus. So the stimulus is uh, detected, the responses occur. It doesn't matter what kind of stimulus you use, and we heard about Regina's studies of uh, odor conditioning earlier, uh, but tones, lights, context, odors, all can be used. Uh, it doesn't matter what you measure as the uh, output response of the behavior, autonomic, hormonal responses. It doesn't matter what kind of animal you do the studies in, the amygdala is a key part of this defense conditioning system. Now, these guys don't have an amygdala, so they, they learn, uh, they do their defense conditioning in a different way. So, you know, we could put the, the chain of uh, events even further back. Uh, I don't know if a bacteria learns anything, but uh, somewhere between single cell organisms and uh, uh, other invertebrates, this ability to, to uh, detect danger and learn about novel dangers uh, by associ forming associations between dangers and novel stimuli. Uh, appears in, in early uh, uh, invertebrate evolution and somehow is uh, continued in vertebrate evolution through the presence of an amygdala and fish all the way through humans. So the amygdala is here uh, in this example. So the hiker is walking through the woods. He's about to step on the snake. He freezes. Uh, his blood pressure and heart rate begin to accelerate. Uh, the stimulus goes into uh, a way station in the uh, lower part of the brain called the thalamus, and then it will go to the cortex where the person can perceive the snake, but it also gets to the amygdala directly from the thalamus. So uh, our, this provides a quick and dirty uh, input to the amygdala. Um, the, in this case, we see something that's roughly uh, snake-like, but uh, it could be a stick on the ground rather than a snake. Uh, and the person in this context would probably also halt if you saw, you know, if you were walking along and there was a, a curved snake or a curved stick on the ground, you might halt over that. So the idea is that through this pathway, we can't distinguish a stick from a snake, uh, but evolutionarily, we're better off treating sticks as snakes than snakes as sticks, so we don't uh, step on it. Uh, and then through this pathway, we become, uh, we, we can evaluate whether it is in fact a, a snake. Now, sometimes we talk about these as unconscious and conscious pathways. Uh, my thinking on this has evolved considerably since uh, I published this in The Emotional Brain in 1996. I think probably both of, all of this is unconscious. And until the information reaches prefrontal cortex or other neocortical areas, it isn't represented in consciousness. Um, but in order to get to the prefrontal cortex, it has to go through the, these uh, visual cortex uh, areas. Uh, not to the amygdala, but from these visual cortex areas to prefrontal areas. So we, while the cortical areas are the, the route to conscious awareness of the stimulus, uh, the cortical areas are not necessarily, the, the uh, cortical processing of the snake is not necessarily uh, a conscious stimulus that activates the amygdala. Uh, one way that we get ourselves into trouble sometimes is um, by perseverating over um, adversity. And so if something, if we're uh, confronted with a stress, uh, we often have an emotional reaction that perseverates, that uh, uh, just goes on beyond the point where it's useful and uh, goes on beyond the point where the stress is actually present. And one of the things that we find in the brain is that's expressed in prolonged activation in a particular part of the brain called the amygdala, which is very important for emotion and particularly for stress and negative emotions and anxiety. And so we've actually been able to measure the duration of time that the amygdala responds to a particular discrete emotional stimulus that we can present in the laboratory. And one of the things that we found is that practicing mindfulness will uh, actually lead to faster recovery in the amygdala. The amygdala comes back down to baseline more quickly. So uh, there's a response. It doesn't change the response itself, but what it does seem to do is it changes how quickly you recover. Uh, and that may be a key attribute of resilience.
And is this a long-term thing? I mean, sort of the, the more practice you have in mindfulness, the more resilient you naturally are? Our data do indicate that there is, in fact, a correlation between um, the number of hours of formal practice uh, and um, the rapidity with which the amygdala recovers in, in this particular way.